So the primary purpose and topics of this video is going to be to talk about the card design of the Grand Tournament and to talk about power creep also. And inside those two topics there's going to be like small mini topics. Basically this has to do with card design, about balance, about my personal philosophy and idea about what makes new Hearthstone cards good or just even cards in collectible card games good in general. This is inspired a little bit by Kriparian's video of bad cards do not need to exist and also his subsequent talk with Ben Brode about how Ben Brode countered, okay b bad cards, it's kind of good for them to exist for some things. And I'm kind of going to take not a middle ground stance, but not either of their stances either. Uh, if anything, I probably am more in the Ben Brode camp, but there's some key other topics that I want to bring up, specifically relating to this com upcoming expansion. The one thing that I kind of dislike about the expansion is that there are so many cards which seem mediocre or even bad. This morning, I actually briefly watched Life Coach review the cards and everyone's gonna have their own opinion on like how many cards are good and how many are bad but I was told at the end of the review that Life Coach said something along the lines of like okay 16, 14 good cards, something like that. I actually think there are more cards than that but out of 130 to have that many that's not so good. Okay apparently Life Coach says uh, I'm being told 11 good cards and then he was like oh but that's enough to change the metagame still don't feel too bad that there's only that many if there only end up being that many because that could be enough to change the entire metagame i'll start off by saying i don't think there are only 11 good cards and i actually think there are some that are going to shake things up but i will say that if there were only 11 good cards in the expansion that would be really bad for the set inspire overall in this expansion is a concept that was a great idea and is a great idea but I just think that on several cases the design team went a little too timid off the cards. Uh, what's required I believe to make an inspire card good or reasonable is that if you play the card and you use your hero power the same turn the card should be about the same power level as a good card or rather it should be just a little bit weaker. And that's a big deal because it turns out that the dream where you're gonna have a lot of cards out there with Inspire and you push the hero power and then all of them activate, that's not gonna happen in competitive play because it's so difficult to keep these minions on the board. With Flame Waker you can get continuous value as well. If you play the Flame Waker and immediately activate it by playing a spell, then it's a good card. And past that if you can activate it even more, that's a great card. That's what I kind of hoped Inspire would be, but instead, Inspire was, I think, overvalued, and I don't think that the cards are powerful enough by themselves to justify like having them stay on. Argent Watchmen, first of all, the drawback is severe enough that just being able to activate it to be able to attack is uh, a bit too much, uh, and this actually brings me onto a specific Ben Road quote. Uh, he says something along the lines of, everything that doesn't make your deck, that isn't getting played, falls into the tier where the card is considered bad. And this goes back to the general video of, do bad cards have to exist? And Ben Brode says, you can't really ever make every card good, because there's a limited number of cards in your deck, and there's a large card pool. So even if the card designers, the balance team, hit the razor thin line of balance where every card was within 1% of each other there's going to be completely unplayed cards but here's where I have to like come back and this is what Kriparian also says uh, Krip says initially that the good cards are like a 10 out of 10 or a 9 out of 10 and the bad cards are 2 out of 10 but he wants them to be 6 out of 10 and that's the number one thing that I agree with Crip on. It doesn't necessarily have to be the case for older cards but especially when they're coming up with new cards it's I think really important to have more cards 
tow that line of balance to be within 1% of each other. Because if there are too many bad cards, then there aren't enough cards to work with for the people who want to construct new decks. Like, for example, this Argent Watchman is probably the easiest one to say, okay, this is like a 1 out of 10 or 2 out of 10. If you make it a 2-mana 3-4, it's still not a top-tier level card. It's like maybe a 6 out of 10 or a 7 out of 10. And then maybe it sneaks its way into some of the decks and like it can be used. Uh, that would be interesting, but to have it just be a 2-4, that's a waste of a card slot. Acid Maw, this one was hilariously underpowered. No one's going to run a 7-mana 4-2 even if you can unleash the hounds and like kill everything, or even if you can combo it with the other part of the uh, Hunter Legendary. So it was so weak that we're just going to lower the mana cost and it'll still be bad, at least by making more options and by trying to like come up with things that are like within 10%, I'd say, of the like playable, then there's so many more options to consider. Like as stands, everyone can just look at Acid Maw and be like, no, I'm not gonna put Acid Maw in my deck. And and like you look at the second Acid Maw and honestly you probably still say, no, I'm still not gonna put Acid Maw in my deck. But now it's a little bit more. If all of the one out of ten cards are removed, won't the four out of ten and five out of ten cards just be considered one out of ten because our perceptions will change? Uh that's a good question. Now here's the thing though. There's a difference between bad cards existing and them being trash cards and bad cards existing and them being like barely playable enough in the right case. Mind control tech isn't in a lot of car uh, decks right now, but that doesn't make it a bad card because if the meta were to ever be like enough minions out there, mind control tech is run. Sunwalker is considered a bad card right now. Most decks don't play it, but every so often it sees its way back in, mostly because of Patron right now, where it can like actually block them and still survive to block another one. Sunwalker is a bad card. It's not played, but uh, so is Silverback Patriarch. Uh, that's a bad card but it should never be printed moving forward. And that covers the topics of like the grand tournament card design. But now I want to talk about like power creep. There have been some people in the community of Hearthstone who have been like up in arms, and this is shocking to me, about the power creep in Hearthstone. But it is not a problem that Booty Bay Bodyguard gets power creeped into a card that's not going to be played still. Uh, evil Heckler, and it's completely fine for Magma Rager to get power creeped into Ice Rager. You may ask, okay, then why not buff the old cards? Ben Broad actually came up with this idea, and I originally was along with the uh, Kriparian camp on like, okay, let's just buff all the old cards by a little bit, similar to how I buffed like the Grand Tournament cards by a little bit. But here's the thing, when you're starting the game, you basically get like some basic cards. I think playing the Witcher and like having Gwent on there kind of illustrated the point a little bit to me. In Gwent there would be like a 0 mana 10 10 and then there would be a 0 mana 1 1 and Gwent starts you off with like a 0 mana 1 1 and what that like kind of spoke to me on is that really early on you get rid of the 0 mana 1 1 in your deck and you just put in like the 0 mana 5-5 five, five next. You feel like you're making some progress early on. Uh, you begin with some really bad cards, and you don't even have to put them in. There are enough good enough cards in the basic deck that you can put together a competent deck, but there are some cards that should stay in the basic set, which should be purposely bad, as Ben Brode says, to teach the new players like, for example, I actually started Hearthstone, and I put in Booty Bay Bodyguard in my deck. That was something I did, because it looked like, oh man, this is 5 mana, 5-4, five, that seems like reasonable stats. Uh, it's got Taunt, that's useful. Uh, I wasn't even a rookie to card games, like, I had played Magic for a while. I think it's a really cool process to begin with cards and then, like, swap them out relatively soon. So, I have absolutely no problem with having some of the cards in the older sets, uh, in the first set, especially the ones you start out with, even purposely be weaker. Additionally, there's like, why won't we just change Magma Rager into a 5-2? Well, Magma Rager, first of all, 
has kind of become an urban legend in Hearthstone. Like, if you were to change Magma Rager to a 5-2 and never print the Ice Rager card, we wouldn't share all the laughs when we saw Ice Rager. We wouldn't have, like, the Moonfire reference. We wouldn't have that Ragnaros versus Nefarian match where you actually push the button as Ragnaros to summon a Magma Rager be nearly that interesting because here you have an ability where you're summoning a 5-1 and you're like, oh man, this is actually really useful. And I think it's so lovely that like the Magma Rager has seen all of this a long time. So it's useful to have bad cards for the newer players because one, it feels satisfying to replace cards in your deck, like, you take out the cards that were weaker, you put in the newer ones, they actually illustratively learn, oh, hey, there's actually just better cards that I can put in. And this exists for, like, almost every single trading card game out there. You can make the argument just because it's a digital card game that you can just retroactively fix them. You bring them up from a 2 out of 10 to, like, a 4 out of 10 or 5 out of 10 by making, like, a very, very small ability, but... Really, all of that doesn't matter, it's still not going to be played, and as far as it goes, I think just having a card there, which serves as like a stepping stone, uh, and gain that satisfaction of replacing the bad card, is worth. What I will say, though, is that I'm not against buffing cards that are unplayed, not in the basic set, to some small extent, especially if you don't plan on making a better card of it. Uh, goblins versus gnomes had a very specific mech synergy to it, and I don't think that we would see another card like junk bot, junk bot printed for a while. You can just retroactively, since this is a digital card game, buff junk bot. Uh, you can buff cobalt guardian. You can buff we spell stopper. Those are the cards that are more in support of retroactively buffing after some time period. And again, like. Every set is going to have its bad cards, but I think there are some cards that are absolute trash. For example, uh, I think it would be a good thing to buff Poison Blade a month after the set is released and no one's playing Poison Blade. Perhaps you can consider my card, the two mana one too. It's just nice to like have a card that was never playable at all and then buff it into like some amount of possibility. Bane of Doom was actually buffed in this way, so don't say that Blizzard has never done it, but basically there are vanilla minions which get brought up for the first time in an expansion, and then at a later time they can explore, okay, so this Lost Tall Strider card wasn't being played, we can add a small ability to it. We can give it like joust, sometimes it gets charged. And that is what I think.